Welcome to Via the Grapevine, proudly brought to you by Tony DeCosta of Liquor City Claremont and offering you the chance to learn more about wine, the masters behind them, and even which wines to collect. My guest today has worked as a winemaker in the USA, North Holland, Australia, Spain, and of course here in South Africa. And this experience has helped him to focus on the important elements, irrespective of the area or style of wines he was making and sees him now the cellar master at the 2021 Top Performing Winery of the Year. Kalaina Zolza, Wine Estate in Stellenbosch. Alistair Rimmer, welcome to Via the Grapevine, sir. Yeah, thanks, guys. Lucky to be on with you. Congratulations, firstly, on the slew of five-star ratings achieved by you and the team this year and the recently announced coveted gold medal at the uh, 2021 Concours Mondial du Savignon competition. Did I pronounce it correctly? Better than me. <laughs> but that's absolutely phenomenal, phenomenal achievements. Uh, and, and, and well done to you and the team. Yeah, thanks, man. I mean, obviously, it's, uh, we work hard. And, and like anything, you put more than just hard work. You, know, you put a little bit of literally and figuratively blood, sweat and tears in, into to something. Uh, it's nice to get a bit of recognition. And wine is a little bit subjective. There's no right and wrong when it comes to the world of wine. So there's quite often where you, you do all everything and you think you're a really great wine and no one else seems to agree with you. So when they do agree with you, it's a, it's, it's a nice sort of recognition of the hard work more so than anything else. Indeed. Well, it's interesting. I want to take a few steps back. Your heritage in wine starts in Benoni where I've never encountered a vineyard. Uh, so what drew you to a career in wine? Yeah, I think I think we're going to really put this one out there. It didn't start in Benoni. Yeah, <laughs> Benoni. Um, no, just uh, by chance. And it's a very sort of long sort of story and a long evolution to it. But uh, one way or another, when I was a, a teenager, um, you know, 14 odd years old, my parents had caused to come down to the Cape with some other friends. And it was the first time I'd ever really gone and tasted wine, you know, being... Typical back then, we referred to it as Bali tourists. Um, yeah, cake, come down. cake dars, I think. We, we, we yeah, exactly, to you in exactly. KZN, cake and dars. <laughs> we, yeah, my folks went to go taste wine back then. There weren't like lots of tasting rooms. It wasn't a very formal, you know, easy thing to do. You had to make appointments and whatnot. And I went along and I was sniffing all the wines with them. And it sort of was interesting to me. It was fascinating, but it, it didn't really anything. And then, you know, sort of looking to study something, didn't really know what I wanted to study. And I had a chance meeting with a viticultural professor while I was walking around campus, just as a 16 year old, just having a look at the Stellenbosch campus. Me being, yeah, my mother tongue is English. And at the time, barely being able to, to introduce myself in Afrikaans, Stellenbosch wasn't really on the radar. Um, but he talked about in this meeting that I, and I literally I bumped into him on campus. Uh, and he talked about growing wine. And I remember asking him saying, yeah, but you don't grow wine, you make wine. He said, oh, that's where you got it wrong. And I, it wasn't a light bulb moment. And I said, oh, I want to go make wine. But I think it was, that was the seed that was planted. And somewhere along the line, I, and I can't remember consciously when it happened, but I thought, yeah, maybe I want to go try this out. And I remember my dad being a bit unimpressed uh, and my mom going, oh, don't worry, Robert, it'll just be a phase. <laughs> he'll else to do after he goes and does a year or two of past the he'll figure something else out. Um, 25 years later, I'm, I'm still going through that phase. And achieving so much in that phase. Your no, experience no. working around the world must have shaped your philosophy on winemaking. Can you, can you share some of the highlights that you've learned along the way? You know, you, you, you come out of university full of theory packed full of all the ideas and you learn about every winemaking technique ever discovered or thought of sort of idea. So you, you know, you, you go into a winery and it, and it is a bit of a shock to your system. You'll, you'll find there's quite an attrition rate, you know, winemakers that study uh, and then winemakers that actually stay being winemakers. Um, two things, you know, especially from my side of things where you didn't really know what was going on. I didn't grow up on a wine farm. So, you know, maybe some of the guys that study through that avenue are a little bit more exposed to the, the behind the scenes and the hard work and the, the, the long hours and the, you know, the, the, un, the unglamorous side of the job. Um, but you come out 
full of ideas and you sort of get a bit of a rude awakening. It, it, yeah, there's a, there's a reality to it. There's, there, there's limitations to what you can and can't do within a certain vintage. And it's not all, you know, if they say in Afrikaans, man's going in the rosa. And I think as you learn, and any winemaker will tell you this, as you sort of get more experience, you start realizing that, and this is true of life and most things, there are the only certain things that you can really control. And there's other things that you can't control. And, and while there might be a hundred things you can control, um, you might only have time to control half of those hundred things or 10%, whatever it might be. And so you start over time, start figuring out for you and your style of wines and the areas that you're working in, what are the most important things to, to look after? And I think if nothing else, I've gone from one end of the spectrum to getting more complicated, more everything, more scientific and more everything about the approach to, to almost going back saying, just, and it, this is oversimplistic, but focusing on the basics, focusing not necessarily on the basics, but the things that are important. And, and yeah, you know, there's a handful of things. If you can control as best you can and focus your energies on those, those things, yeah, you know, you've got 95% of the job done. And then the next 5%, which is lots of little things, is fine tuning. Um, and, and my job at Clean Results is effectively, you know, making sure that my, me and my team do the 95% right. But then also is to give my team the room and the tools to be able to focus on that 5% uh, in their own time as well. Oh, I love that. I was just going to ask you, you, you hit up the winemakers at Clean Azolzo. They, they come with their own experience uh, and ideas. Uh, how does that blend influence the approach to winemaking at Kleiner Zolza? Oh, it, it, it's a tough one, that. I mean, yeah, at the end of the day, I'm the cellar master. The head winemaker, chief winemaker is, is RJ Puerta. And, and RJ in his own right is, a, is an unbelievably talented winemaker. He's a real sort of rock star, but he's an unheard of rock star. I suppose, you know, he's not, you know, not small sort of, cool, funky hips day, we had a more conservative, traditional brand. And so he maybe flies from that aspect a little bit under the radar, but he, he, he's, he's a winemaker in his own right. He's got his own ideas. And yes, it's don't give my, the most challenging thing of my position is to, because I'm a winemaker for, first and foremost, I love making wine, is, is to, to, to not overmanage my stuff, not be a micromanager, not sort of you know, nickel and dine them into a direction. It's, it's where to stand back enough and let them be their own winemakers. And, you know, you know, if you read Richard Branson, he always talks about employ people that want your job, you know? And, and I, I'm not to say that Arjun necessarily wants my job, but he, he sure as heck's got the, the talent and, and the capacity to do my job and evolve into what I do. And I've also then got to realize that he's, he's talented and talented people need to be given the room to, to express themselves. And, it rolls down through the whole team of winemakers. My, my um, yep, various winemakers, I don't want to call them assistant winemakers because they've all got their own winemaking responsibility. They're winemakers in their own right, but there's three that effectively report to RJ. And, and they've also got to have their own room to grow. And, and I think they also come with a fresh perspective. If you, if you force your philosophies and your styles onto the team, they get, they get stuck in a rut and they, 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 Forget the, I mean, at the end of the day, there is an artistic side to winemaking and they, they don't express their artistic side. So it's all about letting them be what they want to be. And, and RJ and I are lucky. We work exceptionally well together. I suppose if I like style on this side and he likes style on that side, it might be a bit more fractious. Yeah. But we, we, we both appreciate the same aesthetic in wine. We like similar things in wine. So it works exceptionally well for us. And, and I always say it, I, I shouldn't say it out too loud because my bo boss might think I'm superfluous to the process, but yeah, I've got a really easy job from that point of view. Uh, yeah, I've got a team that is really talented. And yeah, and RJ's cool. When, when he needs a bit of help or he needs a second opinion, effectively, I'm RJ's sounding board. I'm, I'm the coach on the sidelines and my video coach and makers are the team on the field. That's a fantastic analogy. And I suppose it's also where Project Z comes into, which we'll talk about a little bit later on. Uh, but to the wines, the offering mm. of Kleiner Zolzer now, your award-winning wines, known for their distinctly South African character, they're boasting lively, full-bodied flavors that reflect the local climate and terroir. Would you mind just taking us through the portfolio of wines that Kleiner Zolzer offers? 
We've got four and a half hours. <laughs> you don't no, have no, to go into detail on each. You can literally just tell us the different no, tiers. It's, it's very loosely. We've got sort of three uh, levels. Is I don't like using levels because it sort of implies... Uh, One's better than another. Yeah. Good, better, best, side type idea. And, and I think all our wines have their own personality, their own identity. So I think it's three separate styles. Yes, there is a price tiering to them. Um, yeah, we are a business. You've got to yeah, be aware of that sort of stuff. You don't want to cross compete. But uh, a lot of people really enjoy the one style or the other. And, and I, I, I've just been up in Gauteng for, for most of last week. Um, doing some dinners and tastings and trade and media things and public tastings and whatnot. And, and the, it really hit back to me that people appreciate different things in our wines. Yeah. I'll show someone, you know, a family reserve. And then they say, yeah, I really liked it, but I don't want to be funny, but I prefer the, the other one, which happens to be a cheaper one or whatever it might be or the other way around. So we've got the seller selection wines, which are almost probably the most widely distributed, what most of the, the, the readers uh, and listeners will, will, will know um, they're made, you know, as the seller selection says, you know, the seller, the winery goes and selects parcels of, of, of really cool fruit that we think best expresses that particular variety. So, for example, on the Chenin Blanc, we use a lot of Stellenbosch, which we love Stellenbosch, but we also buy a lot of fruit out of the Paderbach. And, and that combo of Paderbach fruit and, and, and Stellenbosch fruit gives us what we think is the best, most honest expression of Sauvignon uh, Blanc. Sauvignon, we might go Durbanville Darling, uh, even as far north as Kukunov, some stuff around Elgin and Elam direction, So and Stellenbosch again. So we might cast the net, yeah? We come to Cabernet, well, we really love Stellenbosch, so most of our Cabernets, including the cellar selection, is focused around Stellenbosch fruit. Um, and, and the cellar selection are just those honest expressions at an accessible price point for the wine by drinking public to go get out. Yeah, they, they always go, this is, as advertised, good quality. It, the Cabernets taste like Cabernet. They're very correct wines. And they're the seller's expression of that variety. And yeah, then the, uh, the next expression we've got in the next tiering is our vineyard selection, which a lot of people refer to as our black label. You know, you've got the white label and you've got the black label. Um, and the vineyard selection is, again, as it, as it suggests, all our wines are true and honest to what they are. You know, honesty and, and, and is probably the best description of our wines, but we then are starting to select specific parcels. It's not necessarily a single parcel, but we select various, what we think are unique expressions and interesting expressions of that particular variety. It does become more Stellenbosch centric because we love Stellenbosch. We're a proudly Stellenbosch property. Um, so most of the fruit, and, and a lot of the wines are wine of origin Stellenbosch in that range. In fact, I think all of them are except the Sauvignon Blanc. Um, and it's expressing the characters that are coming from the vineyard, maybe some of the terroir characters or site-specific characters. But what we then do is use different site-specific expressions. We let them express themselves. And I always say we, we build puzzle pieces and then we put the blend together. We're putting the puzzle together. And what's that is we don't have a picture to work from we make our own picture and our own expression so it's a grouping of vineyards to make a specific wine true to what it says it is being cabernet stellenbosch cabernet or stellenbosch chenin etc so i know a lot of people say to me we use those vineyard selection wines as this is what stellenbosch cabernet can look like or this is what the vine uh, stellenbosch chenin should look like they they're very true at quite a high level and then the last grouping of wines and tearing of wines is the family reserve wines. They are effectively the best of the best. What we think is the ultimate expression. It's not necessarily the definitive you know, expression of what the textbook says a wine should taste like. It's what we think is the best expression of that wine in a given vintage out of our wine. And concurrently, if we just don't think the vintage was good enough to make an ultimate expression, we don't release them in a given vintage. Um, and those wines are then heavily focused around, um, again, Stellenbosch. Uh, and quite often, although they're not strictly single vineyard wines, they're focused on one parcel of fruit, one unique expression. But we do give ourselves a little bit of room to blend a little bit, maybe from another unique parcel uh, or two, 
to just polish the wine off and get it to be the best expression in a year. Absolutely fascinating, Alistair. And I, I now understand uh, why you are employed because uh, it's your job to overlook and oversee all of that and to be out uh, with, with a seller uh, collection, to be out uh, visiting those vineyards and checking that things are going according to plan, etc. cetera. So that's, you've given me a nice clear understanding and I, I don't think you should downplay your role too much because uh, there's obviously a lot for you to do day to day. Um, for our, our viewers, I have to share with you, I was very fortunate to enjoy a tasting of the Kleiner Zolza family reserve wines with Alistair sitting directly opposite me, which wasn't intimidating at all, and uh, a delicious lunch afterwards. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, but two things will remain with me about that day. Firstly, as we sat down, and I don't know whether I should mention her name for her, for her own personal security reasons, but... <laughs> hey, I'm going to throw it out there. I was seated next to Winnie Bowman, Cape Wine Master, Platters Judge, amongst many of the uh, other professional accolades. And she leaned over to me at the start and she whispered in my ear, these are the four finest expressions of these varieties that you will find in South Africa. I think you need to add that to your website as a quote, Alistair. No, I think we might have to. Um, uh, Winnie's obviously, we've known Winnie, but I mean, it's a small industry. So most of us in the industry know most of the, the players in the industry, the various tasters and judges and, and, and critics and personalities and influencers and whatnot. So yeah, it's a small industry. The South African industry is a, is a family really. So yeah, we've known Winnie for a number of years and, and she's been a, always been a very loyal supporter. She's always, liked our style of wines let's put it that way yeah there, there's no right or wrong but they, they, there's opinions and Winnie's opinion is, is is her opinion and lots of other people agree with her opinion that we do make a pretty unique and a pretty special expression of, of those of our wines and again it comes back to our philosophy I don't think it's anything yeah. that we're specifically trying to do but we're making good honest wines you know that are true to their selves true to their place you know that the easiest thing as a winemaker to do is also to chase uh, chase the market. And at the end yeah. of the day, going back to what Prof oh, just said to me, you know, more than, you know, 20, more than 25 or 25 odd years ago, let's call it that, you know, you grow great wine. And, and it's, it, it is a bit of a, you know, uh, overused term that, but it, it's overused because it's true. You mm -hmm. know, we take good fruit and even on the larger volume wines, some of the seller selection wines, we take really cool parcels of fruit and we treat those parcels of fruit with the, the, the respect that they deserve. We don't overwork them in the wine. We don't try and manipulate them to, to be something they want. You know, Cabernet, for example, is, is a great example, especially on that more entry-level wines. A lot of the, 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 the entry-level price point Cabernets taste like generic red wine. They don't mm. taste like and, and And it's one of the most challenging wines to put together is to get a wine that is delicious and juicy to drink and be enjoyed relatively soon after purchase, which a lot of those wines are coming off, you know, you know supermarket shelves and the like, but still be cabinet, which is innately not a super soft approachable wine. So to get the balance of approachable as well as cabinet identity, and that comes to honesty. And I think obviously that gets magnified every level you move through in our thing and coming to the fan reserve. Yeah. It, it is, what I believe and RJ and our viticulturist Henry and Co believe to be the, the best expression of Cabernet that we can make in a year. And so if we get someone like Winnie who obviously likes our wines, I can see why she would say these are the best expressions because we are definitely trying to make them the best expression of what they are. Um, but there's the nice thing about the South African wine industry, there's, there are lots of other great examples. I, I, I can't say we're the best, I, I'm biased. So my opinion wouldn't count. But there are lots of cool expressions, but we like to think we're right up there with the best examples in, in the country and the world for that matter. Well, you've been speaking of the cab, Saf, but let's talk a little bit about the Family Reserve Sauvignon Blanc 2019. What a wow. Uh, and no surprise that it won the gold medal at the uh, 2021 Concours Mondial du Sauvignon competition. It's also won a platinum medal at the 2020 Michelangelo International Wine and Spirits Awards. Uh, 
I'm putting you on the spot a little bit, and I'm, I'm only doing this because you have had experience in New Zealand and Australia. Uh, would you say this is the finest Sauvignon Blanc you've ever tasted? I mean, it, it certainly sounds like it is, according to all the awards. I've got to be careful what I say here, because um, <laughs> I don't really RJ's thing. Uh, he is, he's the chairman of the Sauvignon Blanc Association of South Africa. Yeah, and cut his early winemaking teeth out in Durbanville. He was a winemaker at Natita before he came across to, to Clay and Zolza. So he is, he's definitely the Sauvignon Blanc man in the winery. Um, I love Sauvignon. Like, yeah, I, I like all wines. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm a bit like that. Anything in front of me that's delicious is, is good. Um, I think the 19 is, is starting to show a, a depth and an expression that I'm really chuffed about. Uh, and can I say it's the best Sauvignon I've ever produced? It, produced potentially, the best Sauvignon I've ever tasted. Maybe not. You know, but what is the best? It, it's different expression. So, in the expression that we are trying to achieve, yeah, I would take rate right, that nineteen right up there with, if not the best that's come out of cleaners. Also, it's definitely right up there with the best handful that have been produced. Um, it's really starting to show a classy, you know, Sauvignons worldwide, not just. South Africa worldwide uh, can be a bit guilty of being quite showy, quite aromatic up front, but then not quite lacking and following through on that aromatic promise. And, and it's something we are very specific about, especially on our white cyclones, also we love texture and, and it's forgotten too much on white wines. It's all about aromatics. And then, you know, if it's a little bit lean and mean on the palate, no one really worries about it. Whereas we really want to build richness and texture. So those aromatics must lead through to the palate and give you a bit of breadth and richness on the palate. And people don't think of that in Sauvignon. They think Sauvignon must be light and bright always. And mm. that's the beautiful minerality on the wine. And, and it is definitely my personal favorite of the family reserves we, we, we produced and released in Plain as also. There are many good ones. I mean, we did a vertical tasting of our Sauvignon Blancs the other day. And, and it, was, it, was, it was a really exciting tasting. There were a lot of amazing wines that it aged beautifully. And that's another thing that people don't necessarily think of in Southern Europe. You know, the 19, which is a two-year-old wine, has only just been released. And we're only just thinking it's starting to show its true colors. And I think anyone that buys the wine, one will be rewarded if they open it you know, fairly soon after purchasing. But if they left it hiding in their cellar for four, five, six years, would be rewarded with a whole different and and maybe even more exciting expression of Sauvignon with a bit of age on it. I can highly recommend it. And I would recommend it to anybody that is uh, perhaps had a bit of a negative idea of Sauvignon Blanc, that maybe you've uh, struggled a little bit with the acidity on the palate, then please get your hands on a bottle of this Family Reserve 2019 Sauvignon Blanc because the, the mouth, as Alistair has mentioned, the texture, the palate feel, it's just the most mind-blowing thing ever. Uh, and I keep going back to it. And usually I go back to wines for the, for the, for the nose. I, I love nosing wines. I could sit and nose a wine for half an hour before I even take a sip of it. Um, but uh, with that particular one, I keep going back to taste the taste because my brain was, was not able to kind of, it was going, but let's hang on. This is, this is smooth and textured and, and round. And are you sure this is a Sauvignon Blanc? <laughs> so, wow, absolutely sensational. Uh, mm. We move on, Project Z. It used to be like a, what, Area 51 of the cellar, but now it's been released for us all to enjoy. Uh, I think you touched on it at the beginning of our conversation with uh, regards to the ethos behind uh, this range. It's an opportunity for your winemakers to uh express their creativity is that right is 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 that the kind of thinking behind this when you've already got such a winning formula with your current ranges yeah a couple of things i just first to kick off we had a big debate in in at, at planers also as to project z or project z and it's a bit of a debate and it's funny how many south africans go with project z but that's very American. So uh, between Project Z and Project Z, I think we've settled back in plain as Zolza on Project Z because we're South African and we want to keep it that way. But, you know, it, it is whatever it is. That, that's just semantics. But yes, I'm glad it, you had that, that conversation because it is. It's, a, it's an interesting one. I would have, I would have 
I think I, I, I went with Z because I think I, I overheard it at the lunch, but I, I agree with you. It's, Z is yeah, South African, me, bro. I, so I, I used Z. I was, I mean, I lived in America for six years. So I, it wasn't unfamiliar to me. And I don't know why. And lots of people. <laughs> yeah, they go, hang on, that's right. It's South Africa. It should be Z. But anyway, we digress. Yes, it was sort of, I mean, those those wines, although they were released, were, that, I don't think we necessarily set out to make something unique and different uh, that should be released as a range. It, 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 it was born of a desire to improve our, our, our Shannons, funny enough. You know, and we're looking at, at, at Shiraz, and, and, and both of them required a, 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 a bit of a step change on technique. And you don't want to just change technique for technique's sake, especially on a success, commercially successful wine. I mean, Planners Alza wines have always done well and sold well and been enjoyed by a lot of people. So you, you don't want to be one of those that goes, oh, what we're doing is wrong and just change it and then, you know, not work out. You've got to be comfortable that you can do something that's reproducible on a, you know, on a larger scale. And so it was winemakers, come on, let's sit around the table. Let's throw some ideas in the pot, what we think are the strong points of our wine and points that we can maybe improve on and then come up with some ideas. How do you think we improve it? And, and so we started making these, for lack of a better word, smaller batch wines to experiment with, to see, okay, does those, do those techniques have, hold promise? Some years, they, 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 when we first tried them, maybe it didn't work, but there were signs of life, so we continued with them. In some years, we thought, no, these are brilliant. These are, these are seriously good techniques, and we're moving in the right direction. But let's see if we can recreate that. Because you don't want to release something or add it into a blend, and then next year, you don't have that component. Yeah, you've got to also... Consistency is very important at Klein and Zolza. We don't ever want to dip in our consistency. You know, smaller single vineyard bottles, people are aware and are happy that there's a bit of vintage variation. But for us, people know us as being these consistently, brilliantly, you know, wines. And so we don't want to, we want to evolve them, but without dipping on our consistency. So yeah, we started doing a couple of these wines. I mean, we started experimenting with terracotta and fora from Italy on our Shannon fermentation side. We started working with a bit more whole cluster uh, fermentation on, on Shiraz or Syrah. And so we had these interesting wines, but then it was like, okay, well, there's no point in just blending them away. Let's mm. bottle a little bit and see how they evolve in the bottle. Let's see how these components evolve in the bottle. And so we did that. And, and four years down the line, we said, geez, we've got quite a few of these wines in bottle and they're quite delicious. And as much as the winemakers would probably have loved to drink them all, we thought, well, we shouldn't be so selfish. We should share it <laughs> with the world, even if they are in these micro volumes. Yeah, you know, just to show people that you know, making really great plain as Alza wines doesn't come without a lot of thought, you know, and evolution and thought of direction and style. Um, yeah. A lot of people think plain as Alza, are you just some big winery somewhere and you just churn out great wines. And that's the last thing we want to do. We don't want to be a, a sausage machine winery that's just put, taking grapes on one side, pushing soulless, unthought of, you know, you know, non sort of honest wines. We want to produce honest things and, and, and evolve things, you know, and see how we can craft those wines better each year. And so projects are born out of that. And, and it's been wildly successful. The, the, there's been you know, lots of good feedback about, about the wines, but some of those lessons we are learning there are slowly being incorporated into the family reserves and the vineyard selections and the cellar selections, those lessons are being applied and adding value and making those wines even better. So it's an exciting project. And also if you're looking for some uh, fortified uh, sweet wine, <laughs> that's where you'll find it. Thank you for sharing with us that. I, I don't even know what it was, but it was absolutely beautiful. Yeah, that one, that one was, was less, less, that was that why that wine was actually born out of a, a, a numerous unsuccessful experiment. Oh wow! So sure. hang on, they were unsuccessful, but they're in a bottle and they were drinking quite well. Yeah, I ended up having about four or five vintages of attempted noble late harvest, and um, they were going nowhere in the wine. They weren't good enough to release, but they were good enough not to want to just make disappear. So. What are we going to do with them, and how are we going to preserve them? And 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 the RJ came with the the, the idea. He said, 
Um, yeah, you don't want to just keep on adding sulfur because they're getting old. I mean, the one, the oldest one was my produced back in 2015. Now we, we're sitting at the end of 2018 already. And so I said to him, he said, yeah, I said, what about fortifying these things? Yeah, and just putting a bit of alcohol in them, and that's a great preserving factor. So we, we fortified them, but we also actually then turned them into an incomplete solera. So we blended them all together and then put them back into barrel as a four-year vintage blend. And by the time 19 had finished and we'd end rolled around and made some more sweet wine, that was actually very delicious. I said, let's taste that, that multi-vintage blend that we fortified. We tasted them and we're like, hang on, this is, this is quite delicious. And the fortification had just tightened the sweetness up a bit. You know, the acidity levels weren't quite as high as we wanted, but the alcohol put a a tightness, not an acidity, but a warmth to the wine that seemed to carry the sweetness a bit better. So we said, hang on, let's bottle some of it. So we bottled a thousand little half bottles and the 19 that we made, we decided there and then, even though it's delicious, we're going to fortify that as well and put it back in for what we've taken out of the blend. So it's a, it's an incomplete Sulera. It's not a really a Sulera in the strict sense, but it's a, a Sulera philosophy. And we hope in 15 or 20 years, it's just going to build that blend, that mother blend is just going to get better and better and more depth and more complexity. So it's a bit of fun. It's not a, we don't take ourselves too seriously at Kalina Zals, although our wines are quite serious. We take, you know, our, we enjoy our, our jobs and what we're doing. So it's a bit of fun on the side. And, uh, you know, as you know, they've got quite interesting labels. All the winemakers, you know, did a lino cut each and, so the winemakers' artworks are on those projects said once. So just coming back to it's a it's a handcrafted small volume. You know, it's, it, 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 it speaks to the intimacy of what we have with our wines and the relationship we have as these things evolve carries through to being on the on on the label as well. Wow, absolutely sensational, Alistair. Besides your award-winning wine. Uh, you've got a phenomenal restaurant. What are some of the uh, reasons, the other reasons that we should hop in the car and uh, visit Kleiner Zalza this weekend? At the end of the day, you know, uh, I said this at a wine dinner this week in, up in Pretoria. Um, for me and for us at Kleiner Zalza, I think Quibus Bassana, our owner, uh, issues these values as well. Wine is more than just wine. You know, it's part of a, of a lifestyle, yeah, and that centers for me, good food, good wine, good company. You know, um, I lived in Spain for a number of years and you know, every, every Saturday and most Sundays, you know, we're at one of the, my colleagues' house with their family on the table, with lots of food on the table, family style, you know, with, with, with lovely, you know, wine and company. Um, and I think that's where we've sort of come through at Kleiner's also. Our tasting room is really, yeah, it's not some as glamorous as some of the places, but it's really comfortable. People feel comfortable there. You know, it's, it's not intimidating. So it's really enjoyable. The beautiful oak trees outside. You sit under the oak trees drinking what we think is quite nice wine. You can come and taste for yourself and decide. But then you know, we've got Nick von Bake and, and Nick's food. He runs our restaurant. Nick's food is always just beautiful and simple and it's not intimidating. Great flavors. And we've relaunched our restaurant as a small plate restaurant. So you can come along and, you know, I did it the other day with friends that came and visited. We ordered the entire menu of small plates. You know, there's 15 or 16 and the five, six of us sat there and tried these little things with different wines. And so it's such a, it's a fun place to come and visit. So you can come and have, you know, lunch and enjoy the restaurant with our wines. Alternately at our tasting room, and this is a really cool combo that we've got going is, and if you come to the tasting room, you're sitting there and then you decide, hang on, well, we're enjoying this, we want to sit a bit longer. You can order the small plates at our tasting room as well for lunch. So you can sit at the tasting room, not planning for lunch, but have a nice bite to eat or even ask one of the, the, the staff to say, hey, we're really enjoying this chin and we're a little bit peckish, recommend a dish off the menu for us. And you can just right there, you don't have to get up. You can get some really world-class food at your thing. So I think it's quite a unique offering. It's a really fun offering. And if I look at... At, at, without too much act, active marketing about the new setup, how many people are flocking to it? It's, it's, it's obviously a popular, popular formula we've got going. I think so too. Fantastic stuff. I know you've got a busy uh, day and I don't want to keep you for too much longer. So I've got some quick fire questions to, 
to wrap up, you can fire off the first word that comes to, to mind for some of them. Um, and we'll start off with a nasty one. Uh, favorite variety to drink? Yeah, I, I suspected this might be coming up, so I, I had a bit of a think about it. I'm specifically going to stay away from varieties that Klein is also makes. If we're going our portfolio, we should probably go Shannon uh, of the mainstream, not in the Project Z side of things, uh, Cabernet, uh, red and white. Um, but you. outside of outside of, of of being a wine professional by day, I'm a wine geek by night. So I love drinking wines from all over the world. I really, really, really love Riesling, specifically Moselle Riesling. Uh, I just love those bright, delicate wines that they make with so much depth of flavor. And I love the wines out of Southern France, um, particularly the Grenache Noir driven wines, the red wines out of Southern France. Uh, those Grenache based bends they make out of Southern France, something I drink quite a bit of at home. It's funny that you should mention Grenache because our previous guest on via the grapevine, the, uh, the rascal. Uh, Ross Sleet also seems to put uh, Grenache in every single thing that he makes. Absolutely loves it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Your most memorable wine tasting experience? Man, there's, there's been so many. Most of the best ones have been, you know, enjoying a really killer glass of wine or bottle of wine with friends, you know, either in the bush or up on top of a mountain or something like that. I think those are genuinely uh, the most, most amazing ones. Sharing a glass of Pinotage and a glass of Shannon with my very dear friend who's the winemaker at Nelson's off on top of Mount Kilimanjaro well, was one of the ones that comes to mind. Wow. Uh, I don't think the wines very a uh, whole lot because we were mook and buggered from climbing the damn mountain. But you know, it's quite a cool place to say you've had a, had, had a glass of wine. Um, but I think most probably from a pure wine geek point of view, um, I just... I'd been out of varsity for two years. I'd been assistant winemaker at uh, Wivakar for a short stint, and I got invited to come with a wine journalist and travel around Europe with him. And I was effectively his, his bag man. I carried his cameras, and I was his, his grunt for the three months that I traveled around Europe with him. But we started off with Vin Expo, and this was back in 2001, 2002. I can't remember, 2001. And... And Vin Expo at the time was by far and away the biggest wine trade show and the entire world descended on it. It was a bit of a pageantry for Bordeaux. And the first night I remember he said to me, yeah, I'm running late, but at the hotel we're staying. He said, just get ready, get dressed in your tux. I'll come pick you up. So I borrowed my dad's tux. I was going to tux anyway. So I get all. And we go driving through. I've never been to Bordeaux in my life. Yeah, this is the first time I traveled in the world of wine in my life, actually, outside of South Africa. And, um, we go zooming through now what is what I know was the Madoc. And we scream in the dark in, into the this, this cellar. And we come around and we're down the avenue. I'm like, hang on. This, this is familiar. And if this is familiar to me who hasn't been there, it must be quite famous. We landed up having dinner in the barrel cellar of Chateau Lafitte that night uh, with a whole lot of other chateau owners. The opening event of, of, of um, Vin Expo. So a lot of the chateau owners or all the chateau owners are invited and a few journalists. And me being this guy's bag man, I was his plus one effectively. And um, that night they served a, vert, a, a horizontal of the five of the 86 vintage. And, and you know, wow. straight up, I didn't know what I was tasting. I, I wish I could do that tasting again with a bit more experience, a bit more understanding of what was in front of me. But yeah, that has to be one of the highlights. And because it happened early on in my career, it was like a real standout. That is absolutely incredible. Sure. Mm. Kind of, uh, it, it's taken the breath away. Um, yeah. okay. Good one. Uh, Ber Berger or Braai for you, seeing as you had so much, uh, you, you've, you've, you've had some time in America uh, with uh, the Z's and the burgers. <laughs> I, I thought, are you still a Braai man? No, I, I mean, who doesn't love a good burger, but uh, Braai for the win. <laughs> Brilliant. And then what's your hidden talent, Alistair? What is it that we should know about you? I'm a remarkably untalented fellow. I've uh, <laughs> never been much on the sports field. I've never been much on anything. Um, you know, jack of all, master of none. I, I'm a, the world's worst fisherman. I, I mean, I've got mates that won't allow me anywhere near their boats because if I'm around, I'm like a hex for everyone around me. So that might be a talent in that I hex everyone around me when it comes to fishing. But I used to, at one point in time, especially when I lived in California, um, be quite a handy fly type. I, I, I tied flies really well. 
don't know why, but I had an aptitude for tying really good fishing flies, trout flies in particular. Um, yeah. But I wasn't much good at using them. My mates used to take my flies and catch lots of fish. I used to take them and catch nothing. But um, yeah, so that's a bit of a quirky hidden talent. I'm a good fly tire. <laughs> there you go. You see, it's those sorts of things that we like to learn about people. This week, we feature a great deal on three cleaners, also wines on via the grapevine.co.za, the seller selection white mixed case, vineyard selection mixed case, and the MCC mixed case. Uh, hit the wine with guy button to buy otherwise get along to liquor city claremont to buy claner zolza wines and if you uh, fancy your lucky stars then answer the easy question here on the via the grapevine page and you could win a mundus vini gold winners pack which consists of a mixed case of a bottle of each of the am i pronouncing it correct mundus vini yeah that's spot on yeah that's grand Grand International Wine Award gold medal winning wines. What a prize. It's uh, whew, worth a fortune. Uh, thank you, Alistair, for your time today. It's been a privilege and an honor. No, thank you. Thanks for having me. It's always like a check thing about wine and whatnot. And yeah, any of your listeners listening out there, come visit us at the farm. You can taste all our delicious wines if you come visit us. Fantastic. This via the grapevine was brought to you by Liquor City Claremont. Visit their wine emporium for a journey via the grapevine.